Let us go to the word, Hebrews 12. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. Our God is the glorious Father. It's the glorious Father. Our God is the glorious Father. Our God is the glorious Father. Ephesians 1.17 says uh, that. He is the glorious Father uh, because he gives birth gloriously to his children. And he also gives glorious inheritance to them. Ephesians 1.18 uh, indicates that. So if we believe that God is the glorious Father, that that he is our glorious father. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is your father in heaven, that he is the glorious father in heaven, amen? We acknowledge him as such and therefore live this life called the faith life, the Christian life, um, which is not, um, not to be taken as a hobby uh, or an optional uh, life, but that it is a life devoted to resisting, fighting to the point of shedding one's blood, and finally overcoming. Yes? Yeah, that's what the word says. You knew it was coming, right? So it's like, whoa, the weather just got cloudy, and now you're talking about blood, shedding blood, shedding blood to overcome, fighting. This does not sound like your po most popular um, message that uh, one may expect to hear in, in church, but this is the word of God, which tells us you must fight, and the way you fight is to death. Yes? Yes. Resist to the point of shedding your blood so that you may overcome and receive that glorious inheritance. That's what the word promises us. Amen. Amen. You've been hearing about the blood uh, past four weeks. Now, um, this is, is this the fourth week? We started with the relationship uh, made by blood, two weeks. And then we talked about um, made as all priests uh, by the blood uh, last week. And then now we're in the fourth week, uh, speaking of blood again. But this time, um, the title and the word coming from the passage is your blood. My blood, our blood. So to the point of shedding our blood. Now, why do we need to talk about our own blood? Because there was one who shed his blood for us, to give birth to us gloriously, to allow us to call him Abba Father, and he is Yeshua, our Heavenly Father. And because he shed his blood, because he resisted to the point of shedding his blood, we are now to follow his footsteps and fight and resist to the point of shedding our own blood so that in the end, not all for vanity, not for meaningless work, but to overcome. And to those who overcome, what does he promise? The glorious inheritance, the glorious crown. How does that sound to you? Does it sound good? Yes? Because glory belongs to only the victors. Only the winners get the prize. You know that. Yes. So you can... Um, Obviously, think of athletic competitions, uh, the Olympics or the professional leagues like the NBA finals, the countdown, right? It's countdown. Some of you are thinking, countdown, yeah, countdown. So they go through a tournament situation, get eliminated, and now you get to the finals, and you can play one game, one shot game like the Super Bowl or the NBA finals, like was it best of seven or seven? Yeah, so you go through all these, and then in the end, there's only one winner. The only only the winner gets the trophy, only the winner gets uh, the title, and even if the other team had 50% chance of winning, just like the other team, the moment that one team wins, it could be one point game, whatever, the other team becomes the loser. It's very ruthless, I mean cold, brutal that way, right up until the last minute, until the, the, the clock runs out, uh, the time runs out, um, they, all have, they have both have equal chance, but the one who pushes through and overcomes, it fights to the last second, only they or he gets to be the winner and receives glory, and the other team or other player is the loser, right? Gets, becomes the defeated. And that moment is like so sad. Of course, like when you root for your team and your team wins, you're just all excited throwing pillow and screaming at the screen, like at the screen, like who cares? They don't hear you at all, but you're like ah, screaming. But then at the same time, you look at the loser's face 
It's so sad. Like just a second ago, like they had the equal chance and they're fighting, especially close games, of course. Like if it's like 20 point game, then forget it. They already have the loser face in fourth <laughs> quarter. But uh, if they're fighting to the last minute, they feel like they have that competitive spirit. They're going to do it until the last minute. But that one second determines the winner and the loser. And you never want to be in that loser's bleacher seat, right? That where they're sitting. It's just very sad. So um, people want to win uh, physically this way when they have physical abilities uh, in, and, you know, to the point of becoming professional athletes. So they have physical strength to build themselves up. So they fight against uh, the weakness of their own bodies and um, their limits. They push to the limits. So uh, then when you get to, you know, competitions like the Olympics, the World Olympics, or where you set records, not only are they, are, are they there to win the medal, but they're also there to break the record. So they're fighting against their own, even their own record. So, you know, Michael Phelps can set his own record at the butterfly race or 400 meter or whatever. Uh, but then his next challenge is not to say, I'm going to beat, you know, the other guys, but it's, I'm going to beat against my own record. And that is perhaps even the most challenging, you know, the, the challenging um, task. And people do break their own records, and they make, uh, they make history that way. So individually, um, athletically, or in team uh, sports, people can... Uh, put effort to uh, achieve or win uh, glory through their physical strength and physical abilities. But when it comes then to um, the power of a strength of a nation, then we're talking then about military forces. So each country has um, develop, uh, or de Department of Defense, as we have here in this country. And depending, of course, on what which party, political party, takes over the administration, then the budget, or the Congress, rather, uh, all of it together, the budget can be shaped right, differently, uh, focusing the budget um, more on or stronger on the defense um, uh, expense uh, or to to uh, allot that into domestic, you know, social services uh, expense. But with, obviously, the heightened sense of fear of terrorism um, and threat of intercontinental ballistic missile coming from North Korea, <laughs> uh, for example, then people can say, we want more money uh, saved for, uh, you know, in the budget for our defense. So they build up the military. So certainly when a nation is at war, they certainly do that. They go to... Um, uh, they, they spend their money and they put uh, all they invest a lot of their budget into building the military forces. So of course, uh, not only does that involve developing weapons and producing weapons, but also uh, expanding the troops. So um, they are then paid and supported. So it's a huge organization and huge expense. Uh, but when a nation wants to prove itself uh, for its strength, it will do that. So what the you know obviously the well-known criticism against uh, North Korea and its leader right now is that while the people are starving to death, like literally starving to death, and even who knows how many people are starving to death to this day, um, but some years ago when the famine struck uh, and they were struggling for years and years, you know, millions of people died in this day and age, you know, while their brothers and neighboring countries in the south, south of them living a completely different life. And why is that? Because the leader wants to spend the majority, even more, of the money, you know, the budget, into building their defense, you know, uh, system, uh, their weapons. So that's why they have what they have now, the IBM or whatever, the, you know, weapons de developing um, uh, all types of weapons. And you, s you see these, you know, clips in the news, they're marching, the military. Meanwhile, you know, people are starving, but their troops are getting fed because the leader thinks that's where the majority of the money should go to. So this is how one can boast one's strength and military-wise uh, as a nation uh, or society. Certainly, uh, if not military, then there's economic power that people talk about. They want to uh, gain their strength in, um, in terms of finance, so they build their economy, and not just in uh, domestic economy, but internationally. They want to make a standing uh, uh, in the global market as the strongest, if not stronger than others. Uh, but also then bring it back to individuals um, 
it could be physical or financial, but certainly people want to build up their knowledge. So wisdom is another way of building one's strength. So every aspect of human life, whether the individual to societal to national, we're always at task and challenge to want to build ourselves up to become stronger because only the stronger gets to win and only the winner gets to receive glory. And again, what is glory? Yes, glory can be um, expressed in the form of winning that trophy, the medal, but it really is what the winner receives. It's very abstract to explain or describe, but um, when you see it, when you feel it, when you experience it, then you know it. Again, the ob you, know, you can objectify into a medal or a trophy, but that's just a symbol. But this whole experience, right, what everyone gives to them and uh, are in awe of and admire them for is glory. That's why people fight hard and work hard to gain uh, glory through their um, challenges. But what the Bible tells us in Proverbs 21, 31 is that victory rests in God alone, which means that glory is in God alone. Amen. No matter how much we work hard, how much we press on to win our own uh, reward or reward that brings us some kind of glory in the world, this is just fleeing and it is temporary and it will perish. However, the glory that is in God alone is the imperishable, eternal, perfect glory because victory rests in him alone. Hallelujah. To reveal himself as the glorious one, the glorious father, even God made man to be a spiritual being, not just physical being, but spiritual being that lives infinitely. But hopefully by receiving the word and, and living by the word of God, that the man, the spiritual being can live eternally like God with God. So that's what uh, God uh, gave. Uh, that's why he gave chance to um, to that chance to Adam, our ancestor, in the Garden of Eden. God told him not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, because if, you, if he obeyed, he would live, but if he disobeyed, he would surely die. So did he obey or not? No, he disobeyed. Certainly he obeyed for a little bit, but when he was deceived by the serpent in Genesis 3 uh, through the woman, he uh, lost the battle of words. So there, the battle there that we see between uh, Adam and the serpent, the devil, uh, was not a battle of weapons, involving weapons, or what you think of as traditional warfare, but the, uh, it was one of words. So the serpent approached the woman and said, did God really say you cannot eat any, uh, from any of the trees? And she said, no, it's just from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent said, you will not surely die. You said God said, he said, you know, he's told us not to eat because if we eat, he, we would surely die. But the serpent said, no, you will not surely die. So in those words, the woman listened or she was deceived by the serpent and listened to his lies. And with those words, she also tempted the men to eat that forbidden fruit. So what happened was they lost the battle that was based on words. So they gave into the lies, the words of the devil, the serpent, and became his slave. Second Peter 2.19 says, and not just Adam and Eve, but all men coming after them because they are the ancestor of the spirit that we all are today. They became slaves. We all became slaves. We all became defeated in Adam before the devil and therefore destined to live in sin, death, but not only that, in toil and shame. As God said to Adam and Eve, as a result of their sin, they are to toil all their lives by the sweat of brow they would eat. And yet, even, even so, the ground would only produce this thorns and thistles, and all their work will go in vain. And that's what King Solomon indicated in his book, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Everything under the sun is meaningless. That became the reality for all men because of their defeat. But because God is the glorious one, the winner, the victor, he was revealing himself, uh, this attribute, by uh, continuing his work, calling on a people. And they were the people of Israel. Right. So um, the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 14 says, the, the Bible is a book of wars. Right. So it is a record of wars. So it has a record of very unique history of wars. Because usually when you study other nations and their history of wars, it's about, you know, again, 
how much physical strength they had, how much how many weapons, how great their weapons, their strategy, you know, was, and and the generals and the commanders in chief, how great they were, how smart they were, how valiant they were, so on. But the history of Israel is very different because, first of all, they did not even have human leader for a very, very long time, right? So the very first battle that we see in their history as a people, as a nation, occurs on the night of the Passover. So the Passover was the night when God sent Moses, after God, sent, God sending Moses to bring the people out, the king of Israel, uh, Egypt refusing them for all that time, but on the 10th play, which involved the death of every firstborn, the people of Israel were spared from that destruction because of what? Because of the blood. Are you with me so far? Yes? Yeah. I, know, I saw many of you on Monday, and um, we were rained out, so we were all in here, and uh, you still had a good time, right? Yeah, I think so. It was a very interesting, impromptu situation, but we still handled it, handled it okay. Uh, Chris was saying, like, I was very impressed. You guys, like, handle these changes very well. Yeah, yeah, we're very trained. We're like soldiers. Like, whatever you tell us, we're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready to do. So if you are a soldier, say amen. Soldiers of Christ, amen? amen. Then there's not a moment where you go, I'm feeling a little tired. Then it's done. The battle is over. You don't want to be the loser, do you? No. Never we want to be winners. Amen? Yes. So put strength in your eyes, in your mind, and listen on, right? So um, the Passover lamb, uh, it, it came to be known be because God commanded them to kill a lamb and put its blood over the door frames. When God would see the blood, he would pass over that home so no death would harm, no, you know, no, no one in the home would be harmed like the firstborn uh, by that blood. They would be spared. So that night... Um, involved death while every ha household in Egypt had death. Only those with the blood of the lamb survived. So already the battle had begun with the people of God, the, the, the people of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, leading them to their victory against their slave owner, the master, the Pharaoh, and his people, we see the beginning of their history of war. So very unusual because the one who allowed them to leave their slavery, meaning their victory, right, that defeated their worldly king, was because of God who they could not see and they had forgotten about, but they were reminded by Moses instilling in that, remember him, the one who promised our ancestor, our father Abraham. That is our God, the Lord God, and we're going to worship him. So in Exodus 14, 13 to 14, God said to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Now this was right before they were about to cross the Red Sea because after leaving that plague, the, um, uh, the land of Egypt, they, they met the Red Sea close in front of them, and they were saying, oh, my God, now we're sandwiched between the Red Sea and the Egyptians. We're going to die. But Moses said that you're not going to die. The Lord will deliver you. So he continued and said, the Lord will fight for you. Who will fight for them? The Lord will fight for you, and you will only need to be still. Be still and watch this. So what God had Moses do was to raise his arm, the staff, and what happened to the sea? It parted. It parted. It opened so that the people of Israel would walk through like as if it were dry land. But by the time the pursue, those who pursue them, the Egyptians, they're in their chariots and horses coming after them, the sea then closed and all of them died in the water. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen? So that's why Moses said, you will not see them ever again. The Egyptians that you see kicking dust over there in the back, fighting, coming after you, you will never see them again because the Lord will fight for you and you will win. It's a very unusual, unique beginning of the history of warfare, but it continued on. We see them marching into, after the 40 years of desert life, um, those who survived follow Joshua into the promised land called the land of Canaan. They crossed the, Jor uh, the Jordan, the, uh, the river Jordan, and entered the promised land. The very first battle that they had was what? Against the city of Jericho. The city of Jericho. So they went into, march into that city, but the way they took over the city was not with catapults and war, uh, arrows and bows and arrows and, and TNT or whatever it is. What, how did they 
How do they fight against the people in Jer Jericho? How do they take over the city? With the shout. <laughs> even, it sounds funny to even say it, right? How do, they, how do they do it? They gave a shout. Shout a victory after uh, going around the city 13 times in those seven days. And they gave a shout. And when they shout, when they shouted uh, towards the city, the city, the walls of city came tumbling down. Hallelujah. So they overtook the city. And again, very unusual. But not only that, it continued on. So there was a time where, um, so they had to go into this promised land. And the promised land, the land of Canaan, was not a vacant land. It had six tribes of Gentiles living there. So every corner they turned, every city they conquered, they had to fight. Uh, even though God said, God has given you the city, this is your city, they are your meal even, he said. They are your meal. The meal is in your hand, you just need to eat it. So they had to go uh, and take over, but they had to still fight. But that fight was, it was not because they were just like doing nothing. God, they did have to fight, but God was on their side. So even without the means, the traditional means of winning battles, because God was on their side, God fought for them, and they won. Do you believe that? Very strange people then and strange people now. Yes, it's unusual. There was a time where um, then not only did they have to fight against Gentiles, but they even fought against themselves. So like civil war because the united monarchy broke into two, into the house of Jeroboam and the house of Rehoboam. So the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, kingdom of Judah split. So they ended up engaging in, uh, in battle against each other. So it's like the civil war here, north and south. Uh, and that's what happened in... Um, uh, throughout their history. So there was another time where Jehoshaphat, uh, 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 leading Israel, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17, against the Gentiles. So sometimes the Gentiles will uh, join the, the northern kingdom and then fight against the southern and the south and southern traditionally. So they were constantly at battle with each other. But in this scenario where Jehoshaphat was fighting against the Gentiles, he had, um, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17, he was ordering his men uh, to prepare for this battle. But the unusual way of preparing this was what? How did, he, how did he have them prepare? He had not his warriors, the, the weaponry uh, in the front of the, the group, but he had the priests with what? With instruments. Let's go to war! With tuba, drumsticks, and guitar, and bass. Are you ready? Keyboards? Yes? Tambourine? You got to check, check, check. That's exactly what they were doing. What were they going to do? They were going to praise the Lord. They were going to shout his name. They're going to lift his name. They're going to lift him up for what, who he has done, what he has done. And they were going to praise him. And by that, they were going to beat their enemies. Very, very odd. Very, very odd. But Jehoshaphat, their king, said, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. And what happened at the end of their praising? The Gentile tribe that are surrounding them in confusion fought off each other, killed off each other. So when they were saying, hallelujah, amen. And then when the dust settled, they looked around. All problem taken care of by themselves. Hallelujah. That's how the Lord um, fought for them and defeated for them uh, their war. However, as they became more um, corrupted, they, became, uh, they, became, uh, they started to compromise their faith by wanting a human king. Of course, that happened uh, before the story of Jehoshaphat by asking for a king. Saul was their first king and David later on. And because of human errors, they started to uh, worship other gods later on and idolize you know, uh, these foreign gods and so on. And they um, forsaken the Lord. So at times, they would go and seek the help of Gentiles to help them in their battle. So in places like Isaiah 31, verse 1, it, the word of God warned against them uh, from seeking foreigners' help. So woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. So God warned them, don't look to other people, horses and chariots and weapons for help. I am on your side. If you obey me and you are with me, I will fight for you and you will overcome. To remind them of this, what do they have in their midst? The sanctuary. First the tabernacle in the desert and then later on the temple of Jerusalem. What was inside of it? They were to place the name of the Lord God. Which name was that? 
Jehovah. So 2 Chronicles chapter, 20, chapter 6, verse 20 says, build the sanctuary, build the temple for my name to be there. So the name was to stay there as the name of the glorious king, the glorious God, and he, he was there with them in their midst to guarantee, to warrant for their victory, so of their past and of their future, even, at, even if in their moment, in history, many moments actually, they were defeated, right? They were uh, being occupied by foreign powers. They were taken as captives, exile. As long as they had the temple in their midst, however, they were saying, remember the good times, how God fought for us. Because we have sinned and forsaken him, this is why we are where we are. But if we repent and return to him, he will continue to fight for us and we will restore our kingdom. So how do they have this faith and continue to keep this hope? Because there was prophecy in Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Let's read that together. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up. You ancient doors of the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them out. You ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? This king of glory. The Lord almighty. He is the king of glory. So the people of Israel from then to this day hold on to this prophecy. They are waiting for the king of glory to ride on the horse or however he makes that entrance into Jerusalem to restore the kingdom of Israel and lead to victory, lead them to glory. So even as they were people without sovereignty, they did not lose the hope of their future victor, promised victory, because the temple was there and because of the prophecy. So when the man who referred to himself as the Son of God called Jesus in English, Yeshua in Aramaic, which means Savior, looking at this very temple, what did he say that made these people upset? Destroy this temple. <coughs> You understand why they reacted the way they did. It's like, whoa, overreaction, people. What's the big deal? But what they heard was the challenge to the promise and the prophecy of the restoration of their kingdom, their victory, and their glory. You understand? All the history standing there before them, and they understanding they are the product of this history of God winning for them. And therefore, the promise of the future existence of their people. When Jesus said, destroy this temple, that would mean no more. People, no more nation, no more victory, no more glory. However, what he was referring to was the temple of his body. He was saying that he was going to die in the hands of men, by the hands of men, but in three days he would be risen to life. He was talking about the death and the resurrection of the temple of his body. So what was he going to do? Dying? That sounds like defeat, doesn't it? Yeah, when you die, it's the winner loses in a battle. Only the, only, only, only the survivor wins, vice versa, right? So if you're dead, you're not a winner. But the way he described himself as the son of God coming to become, to reveal as the temple of God, who has the name of God in him. What's the name that he came with? He came in? Yeshua. Yeshua, Matthew 121 says, he, that you will name him Jesus in English, but Yeshua in the original name because he will save his people from their sin. So in that name, which is the name of the Father, the name of God, he will reveal by doing the Father's work that he is the temple to come, that he is the victory, he is the glory, because through his death and his resurrection, he would fight to death to finally overcome gloriously. Amen. That's why he said in John 16, 11, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will let you know about sin, judgment, about righteousness, sin, and judgment. And he said about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So he is saying that he, he's connecting himself, his death, and condemnation against this enemy. And that enemy was called the prince of this world. And he also said in that chapter, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Of course, this is before his death. He's talking about his death, but he is saying, take heart. Don't go weary. Don't be in despair. Don't be sad. Don't act like the loser. 
because I have overcome and I'll reveal to you that I am the winner and in me, with me, you will also become the winner. Hallelujah. Why? Because he came to the world with the mission to defeat the enemy. The enemy, the prince of the world, who is that? The devil. The devil who sinned against God in heaven. So in Isaiah 14, verses 12, let's go quickly for those of you who are new. This may be all new. Isaiah 14, 12. So this, this passage is describing an event before the creation of the physical world. This happened in the spiritual heaven dealing with angels. So verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, a morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once lay low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. So this creature, creature, yes, creature, God made this creature. And he, in Ezekiel 28, it also describes about him, but in, in more details about how beautifully and talented he was made to worship and praise God. And this creature, because he was so beautiful and loved and praised by other creatures named angels, he became so proud and said, I will make myself as high as the Most High. Who is the Most High? God, the glorious God, the glorious King. And here's a creature saying, I will be like him. Why not? I got a following. I got lots of followers, so why not take the throne? But seeing that, God threw him out of heaven and threw him into, brought him down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. In Hebrew, that's Sheol. What is it? Sheol. Sheol. Yes, Sheol is referring to the grave, the depths of the pit. And that is referring to the dark universe where we are. In Hebrew, the same word is ho, I'm sorry, in Greek is ho hades, hades. Hades, some, maybe people take it as underworld, but the beauty of Greek word is that it can include many other things like the world itself, like the universe. So the place where we live is where these fallen angels led by Satan were contained. So Satan means the enemy of God, the rebel against God. So this is the prince of the world that Jesus came to, the son of God came to, condemn and destroy. So 1 John chapter 3, 8, quickly go. 1 John chapter 3, 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So there, it's describing the mission of the appearance of the Son of God. He did not just come to love the world, as John three sixteen says, and a lot of people just know that. They have no clue about this other part of his mission, which is to come to destroy the enemy. Why do you need to destroy the enemy? Why do you need to even have an enemy? For one to have glory. You don't just win. You don't, you don't say, I want glory. Come glory now. Glory doesn't come like that. Glory comes as a result of what? Fight. You need to fight. The reason why I'm, I'm oh, yeah, you're so aggressive, Pastor, Pastor Joe and Pastor Kang. You guys have fire in the eyes, and you look like very aggressive people. You like to fight. don't? It's not just us. It's, that's what the Bible says. The logic is this. For you to have glory, you need to have fight, right? For glory, there has to be victory. For victory to be there, there has to be battle. And for you to have a battle, you need enemy. Do you understand? This is how it goes. So for one to have enemy, then... The devil played that role. He was made as an archangel. And he tempted himself, and he became sin in the eyes of God, became Satan, his rebel, his enemy. But until the moment of the showdown, it's a showdown between the kingdom of heaven and the prince of the world, which would take place where? At the cross during the death of Jesus Christ, God contained this enemy in the universe where men were created and lived until then and to this day. So that's why Yeshua said, I have come to destroy. I have come to destroy and judge the, the prince of the world and take heart because I have overcome the world. He said it so confidently, even though he prophesied about his own death in Matthew 16, 21 to 23. He was talking about in great details to his disciples about how he was going to go to Jerusalem, suffer all the things that had been prophesied about him and that he was going to die. Hearing this, Peter just in the same chapter, who had gotten kudos from Jesus saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
God bless you, Simon, uh, son of Jonah. You are, you are so blessed. You are so smart and so spiritual. I love you. I love you too, Lord. So he's on a roll, right? He's on a roll. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to get arrested. And what does he do now? Never, Lord. I shall never let this happen. And he was waiting for Jesus to say, God bless you once again. But instead, what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. And he went, he's drunk. Yeah. Get behind me, Satan. He said it so directly. And he said, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concern of God, but merely human concerns. Because even his confession that confessed clearly who Yeshua is, that he is the son of, he is the Christ, the son of the living God. That was just momentary inspiration by the spirit. It was not a permanent state. So he said it so that other disciples heard it and wrote it down so we know it, and that's the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ. But he's still human, so he's thinking human times. I'm not going to, because I'm, I'm a man of men. I am a, I am a valiant man. I'm a fighter. I will fight for you. Never, Lord. And the Lord didn't, was not so impressed. He said, <laughs> get behind me, Satan, calling him Satan. Because anyone who's against the will of God is satanic, is of Satan. Because Yeshua also said in Matthew 20, 28, I did not come to be served, but to serve by giving my life as a ransom. So that's why when it was time for him to go to the cross, when men came to arrest him, he did not resist. Instead, he was led away like a sheep silently to the slaughter. And without defending himself, he went to the cross Willingly. Now, why do I keep on saying without defending himself? Could he have defended himself? Yes, because what had he done before? Men, performed many miracles, wonders, and signs. He even said, don't you think that I could call on the angels from heaven, call down angels to heaven to, to help myself, to defend me? But I will not do any of that. Because this moment is the moment that I'm going to achieve, win that victory. For the Father to be glorified as the glorious King, the glorious God, and become the glorious Father. It was the moment that he was willingly laid down his life. So John 10, 17, 18, Jesus says, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So when he died, what did he say? He said, it is finished. Because it was the moment that he completed the mission of coming as man. The word, as you sang in the song, the word that was with the Father in the beginning, as John 1, 1 says, became flesh, 114. The word became flesh. The word became man that described the flesh of Jesus. Even though he was born of a woman, the woman's body was used as an environment for the word to become flesh, not having anything to do with the woman or any man or its sin. He knows no sin, as 2 Corinthians 5 also says. So he who knows no sin became man to take on the sins of men to become sin in the eyes of God. So that moment of his death, he will die with the sin of the world. That in his death, he will fight the fight. Fight the good fight to the point of shedding blood to death, to death, so that he will finally overcome the world, overcome sin, overcome death, overcome the devil, and gloriously be risen to life. Hallelujah. Do you understand? That's why Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy set before him. What is the joy that was set before him? It was his resurrection, the crown of glory. Hallelujah. That is save, promise for the winner alone. He knew that was before him. Seeing the crown he endured the cross. Seeing the crown, he endured the cross. What does the cross represent? Physical pain. Physical pain. Not only, yes, sin. Of course, not to diminish the weight of sin. Sin is what God hates the most. And the Son of God who, has no, who knows no sin became the sin that he hates the most. But in that process, he physically endured the pain and shame. The shame and the toil that the sinner deserves. 
and the sinner lived in. Since Adam's sin, all throughout the history of mankind, the guilt, the shame. He endured. And as if it wasn't enough, they stripped him. They stripped him of his clothes. So he was hung on a tree naked, bleeding to death. He who no deserves such thing. The cross that the sinner had to bear. The sinner that I am, not just, oh, us as people and finding comfort in number, but I deserve the cross. I deserve the shame. I deserve the nakedness. I deserve the flogging. I deserve the nails. He endured. The way he was able to overcome was through endurance, perseverance, because of the joy set before him. And in this process, he fulfilled the Father's will to be glorified as the glorious God, but to also be able to give birth gloriously to the children, the spirits of all men. Hallelujah! And in that process, he condemned the enemy. Colossians 2.15 says he stripped him. He disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of these evil spirits, the devil and his spirits, triumph over them by the cross. Hallelujah! So Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9 describes about this moment. Quickly go to Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. So now if you understand the dispensation, the schedule of God with the will of God that we teach in Logos, this moment is the moment the showdown took place. And that showdown was be between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the world. The prince of heaven and the prince of the, of the world. And that is between the son of God and the devil. And that took place when Yeshua, Jesus, died on the cross. When he died, even though death in the form of being executed on a cross in a horrific way seems to be the most shameful, most hideous way of dying, it was the victorious moment in, for God in the eyes of God because in his death, through his death, Jesus overcame the devil. He defeated the prince of the world by using his body as weapon, the body that can die willingly. He went there at the cross and met the one who held the power to kill. Who had the power to kill? The devil. So the, with the authority to die, he used his weapon. Jesus used his weapon, and he went against the one who held the power of death. It's Hebrews 12, 14 to 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in, in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. Because he is the source of sin, Adam's sin, and the price of sin came, which is death. It's a spiritual death. And naturally, what is the greatest weapon in the world? Why are we scared of terrorists when you hear news about bombing and, and stabbing and, and all these killings? Death. Death is what we are scared of the most. Because reality, spiritual death is waiting after this physical death. And the reason why we fear is because all men were held in captivity and as captives under the devil, the ruler of death. The one with the power to kill. But Yeshua went to the cross, laying down willingly, using his power, the authority to, to, to die by his choice, according to the command of the Father, and nullify, strip the power of the ruler of death by destroying him, his works, at the cross. Hallelujah! And by doing so, he released those who were held in bondage, in chains under him. And that is us, the sinners. Hallelujah. He set us free. He set us free from the bondage, the chains of sin and death of the devil. What do you say? Hallelujah. The father then raised him up in three days. In three days, he rose from the grave. He busted open the, rolled away the stone, and he rose in the same body, but now unrecognizable because he has been now glorified. 
he has now been glorified as the victor. Even those who followed him for those years did not recognize him standing close to him, walking with him. They didn't recognize him. Something was different about him. Even though in his spirit body he resurrected, he still has scars that later Thomas confirmed. They didn't recognize him because now he is the risen Lord, the glorious king, the prince and savior. Hallelujah. And he ascended to heaven and sat down at the thro- on the throne in heaven where he reigns forever and ever as the glorious king, the glorious father of our souls. Do you believe that? Amen. Only if you have received his name, his blood. Say amen if you believe in his name and receive his blood. To such souls, the Holy Spirit, the promised spirit, has come. The Holy Spirit comes not to the world, not to unbelievers. He has nothing to do with them. But only those who have called upon his name, believe his name, and receive the right to become his children, have been born again in his blood. The Holy Spirit comes in the name Yeshua. Amen. What does he do? What does he do? The Holy Spirit does not come into us and let us smell the rosy fragrance of Jesus. So rosy and sweet, I want to fall asleep. No, that's not what church. Many people think that going to church, I go to church to feel peaceful. What does that mean? Feeling relaxed. Yeah, relaxed and no pressure and just restful. I say, stay home. Why do you need to even get out of your pajamas to come all the way here? Go to sleep. Stay in bed. That's not what church is for. The church is a fighting church. It is a body that fights the body of Christ because the head of the church is Christ, the victor. How did he become the victor? He fought to death to the point of shedding his blood. The Holy Spirit comes to teach us, lets us fix our thoughts on him, the author, the perfecter of our faith, Fix our thoughts. What about him? On his blood. Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Nothing but the blood of God. What does his blood mean? The blood that gave birth to me. The soul that was once dead. The spirit that was once dead in sin is now made alive. Because one drop of his blood that I received by calling on his name has given me new life. Do you believe that? That blood. The precious blood, the living blood of God was given to us. How? Because he died. Because he fought to death. Blood is life. But it can only become life to us when the giver died. You understand? Because he died, shedding his blood, I'm alive today. And because he fought to death, resisted to the point of shedding his blood, he overcame. And the Holy Spirit in us today lets us think deeply of his blood, of his death on the cross. The cross is not to be worshipped for itself. It's not the crucifix that we do on our bodies and wear it. It's not an adornment. It's not an object of worship. But we believe in the message of the cross. What is the message of the cross? 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 21. Paul described, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. The cross is death. And from there we receive his blood. From there he fought victoriously to death, shedding his blood. We, the followers of Christ, now by the power of the Holy Spirit, ought to emulate him, imitate him, be imitators of Christ. What do we do now? We need to now fight, resist to the point of shedding our blood. Amen. That's the only way we can overcome, folks. That is what the Christian does. Christian has the duty to resist to the point of shedding blood and overcome by enduring, persevering. Christian life is not, as I said in the beginning, a hobby. It is not meditative. It is not restful. Our rest is in the Father's house in heaven. Until then, we have to work. Work. That work is fighting. 
So it is, to, it is fighting, it is resisting to finally overcome, to win, and to be glorified, just as our Lord was. So endurance is the key to victory. So why do we need to fight? What do, what do we, why and what do we need to resist against or fight against? First, we have to fight against the devil and his spirits. The devil who lost his power of the cross is like a bee, bee without sting or wasp without sting, right? So only little time remains until that wasp dies. He uses only one thing, the only thing that he knows, which is to kill. He used it on the cross, thinking that he dies, and Jesus, like a suicide bomber. He dies, and then uh, and Jesus dies. Jesus did die. It went, pow, on the cross. But in three days, final countdown. And who was proven to be the victor? Yeshua, hallelujah. Because he had the authority to lay down his life and the authority to take it up again. Hallelujah. So the devil messed up. He messed up. He did not calculate. Now he's in trouble. But he's still around because he's an angel. He doesn't die like us. Until he's thrown into the fire of hell and gone, be gone. So that's what Matthew uh, 25 says, that the eternal fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. So until he's thrown into the fire of hell, he is now, as Revelation 13 verse 1 says, he is now sitting on the, uh, he is setting himself at the shore, ready to engage in battle against the woman and her children, her sons, which are the believers, the church and believers. The devil is in taking his position to go into war against believers. The devil is not going to go to like Rikers Island or like, you know, some drug, um, you know, a uh, uh, dealing, you know, a sketch of people out there, criminals, they're already doing a good job. Why fix anything when it's not broken? Keep going. You go do that. Keep doing that. But now the devil wants believers back. Remember, all men were born as slaves of the devil. So the devil wants them back because they, he lost the believer. The believers went, we no, lo we no longer love the devil. We love you, Yeshua. The devil hates that. And he's using his angels, evil spirits. There are deceiving spirits. Deceiving spirits who bring on and, and kick, kick on the into activation, the temptations, the habits, the evil ways that we used to live. They are now put into motion. And what happens? An unclean spirit, demons come to possess the body to bring the believer, the person, to destruction. So therefore, we need to resist to the point of shedding our blood, my blood. To overcome. If there's a moment that I'm just slacking off, I'm already dead. I've already lost the battle. So I must be on all the time. On all the time. The troops who come back from Iraq, they talk about that. Like, you know, Iraq and Af Afghanistan, Paul certainly knows this. How different they're, what kind of warfare. One was urban warfare, not, not having a front line. You know, traditionally during World Wars I, II, they had front line. And even in the early time, they, they saw their enemies on the other side and they shot at each other. But the, the warfares of uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, they just don't know where the enemy is. They don't know if they're hidden underneath that, you know, bag or skirt of someone's dress, whatever. They, don't, they have no idea where it's coming at, so the soldiers have to be always on. That's why they have such a hard time adjusting to regular life when they come back with the stress just being on all the time. And that is how we should be as spiritual beings, as believers, as children of God, as good soldiers of Christ. As 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, we are good soldiers of Christ. Say, I'm a good soldier of Christ. Uh, you're not going to make it to anywhere if you say, oh, good, good, good. you're not even going to get to the gym, people. All right? You got to say it a little louder. I'm a good soldier of Christ. Why don't you add a hua onto that? I'm a good soldier of Christ. Hua. Hua. Yeah, there you go. Paul and Dustin, come on, be useful. Can you say hua for us? Hua, hua. No, say for us the whole thing. I'm a good soldier of Christ. Hua, ready, go. There you go. There we have our vets here. Let's say it together. I'm a good soldier of Christ. Hua. I'm a good of Christ. hua. That's right. You know why they do that? It's like, yeah, they have to pump themselves up, but it's reminding themselves what they're there for. You know, the boot camp, the training, all of that. It's like, yeah, we can't do this together, clearly knowing what our enemy is, what this fight is for, and we are going in, and we are going to win. Amen. Amen. 
Second, our enemy is the world. As the word says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, do not love the world or anything in the world. Anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world also includes people, our loved ones, our family. As you were reminded, we were reminded that on Friday, the unbelieving world is the object of our preaching. We are not to befriend them. We are not to give our hearts and minds to them, even if they're your beloved parents, children, siblings, and friends, even spouse. If you forget that, you've already lost the battle. It doesn't mean that you go and say, I hate you all, I hate you all, I hate your husband, I hate your mother, I hate your father. It's not to say that. But you have to always be on guard, be in control of your conversation, that you don't give your heart away, you don't give your willpower away to, unbelieving wor to the unbelieving world and the unbelieving members of your family, unbelieving friends. They are the people that we need to preach to, but that's it. That's it. We're not to be yoked with the world. We are to fight and resist to the point of shedding our blood. No man? Amen. Jesus said, I've not come to peace, but come to give a sword. Remember that. And we must resist to the point of shedding our blood, our fleshly desire. Because the thoughts of the flesh, the thought of the flesh, the desire of the flesh is the enemy of God, the Bible says. Romans 8, 8 says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile. Hostile. You hear that a lot in the army and military setting. You know, they're really clear about the enemy. Hostile, the hostile situation. There's nothing arbitrary about that. It's black or white. You're either with God or against God. And the Bible says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. So what does that mean for us as Christians, as believers, as good soldiers of Christ? We cannot do everything that world does. We cannot have everything that the world has. But they have it. I want it too. I want to have it. You can't. That's what the world says. You can't. You can't do everything the world does. You cannot have everything that the world, that you cannot touch everything that the world touches. You cannot watch everything that the world watches. You cannot listen to everything the world watches because the world is hostile to God. That's why we have to fight, folks. It involves fight. Saying no is hard, but we have to do it. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, 12 says. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but in spiritual warfare we're engaged in. So as we fight our spiritual enemies, we have to understand the enemy lives within me and my body. So fasting is this powerful tool to say no to sin. Because fasting is rejecting the pleasure of the flesh and you're down to the basics. What is the basics of this human body? It's not that fancy car, fancy bag, fancy toy, or fancy friends, fancy job. It's the need to eat. That's it. Need to eat. It brings us down to the reality. I'm just flesh that depends on food. Let me simplify my life. Be content with the daily bread you give me and do the work that's pleasing to you because I want to overcome by endurance to win victoriously and enter that glorious place. Amen. We must endure, endure the shame. We say no to the fleshly desire, temptation, sin, and evil desires, lust. But we also need to overcome the shame, even our ego. When our ego is damaged, our pride is crushed, we are to accept it and endure the shame. Jesus, who knows no sin, Isaiah 53, 7, he said, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Why does that prophecy Stress that. He who knows no sin could have opened his mouth and say, 
I'm not guilty. This is not because of my sin. It's because of these people's sin, your sin. But he chose to be silent. Even if we are at, time wrong, at times wrongly accused, perhaps within the church, among the brothers and sisters in the church community, and it can happen, we take it silently. We bite our tongue. Because naturally, what do people want to do? Just like if you spit on someone's face reaction when they're immature, they spit back. So verbally, something happens. In it, just naturally, they want to defend themselves, and they go right at it with words. Oh, yeah? You attack me with your tongue? I'm going to attack right back, tit for tat. That's not for Christians. That is not for a good soldier of Christ. We must tame our tongue, as James warns us many times in his writing. Tame your tongue, bite your tongue, put a tight rein on it, just as Jesus overcame. We must overcome the battle of words. Amen. And finally, we must overcome the suffering that the Heavenly Father gives us as discipline for his beloved children. If we are true children, we must endure the suffering. We must not try to escape. At times it can come in the form of persecution, isolation, financial hardship, physical ailments. It could come in many forms. But we are to understand, I am being treated not as an orphan, but as true son. So I thank him and I love him. I must endure. So the word continues there in Hebrews 12, do not grow weary, do not, do not lose heart, do not despair. Therefore, we are not to lose heart in our faith life. We are never to say things like, I'm tired of this church life. Church of Jesus is so demanding. It's so hard. There's so many churches out there, they take it easy. Nobody ever like struggles there. But here it's like, oh, God, I'm so tired. I was here last night till 11 o'clock. I'm again, 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 again. Come again. And if I miss once in a while, is that the end of the world? But they're looking at me like it's the end of the world. Where were you? Where were you? What's wrong with you? Are you okay? I just slept. That's all. But they look at me like I'm dead. I'm like a mummy, walking zombie. Just, I'm tired. Yes, we're all tired. This physical life is tiring. But what we see is the joy that is set before us. We follow Christ, our commander-in-chief. We follow him. We accept no defeat. We accept no defeat, no surrender. Amen. We only accept victory, which comes only through endurance. Endurance is to push my limits, to break through. As even Paul said, physical training has some use, but godly is good. Godliness is good all around. So yes, physical, those of us who are physically training, we understand the limit, pushing the limit, pushing, pushing, pushing. There's always a dilemma. Should I stop running? Should I stop doing this? I, I want to just take a break. I want to relax. When you do that, then it's done, over. But you have to break through that catch myself saying like beat this thing beat things thing. i'm like what am i beating why, why am i saying that to myself i need to beat myself beat this thing is myself my laziness my evil desires my evil tendency my temptation to just give up i need to break through I need to break through. My biggest enemy is myself. I need to resist to the point of shedding my blood, to the point of cutting off my own finger, my limbs, gouging my eye out, cutting my leg off. As Jesus said, if your eye, if your hand, if your foot causes you sin, cut them all off. It's better to go to heaven without them than go to hell with all of them intact. So I need to resist to the point of shedding blood. Then he will help me when I am determined to overcome. He will help us. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Let's close our eyes. As Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. In fact, it was Paul who used the word endure, endure so many times in the New Testament. Because he understood 
that this Christian life is church life, church life, faith life. It requires not a sprint run, but a marathon. It, it requires us to have endurance, to endure through temptations. The world, family, my temper, my fleshly desires, my own limits. But even through the hard times like not receiving answers to our prayers, not seeing fruit, even if I'm evangelizing and praying, I don't have fruit, should I give up? We must never give up. We must endure, break through these limits.